My name is Nick Behrman. I'm the Adolescent Program Director here at Great River, so I get to oversee uh, the 7th through 12th grade program. Uh, but tonight I'm here to talk to you about the 9th through 12th grade program and what a student might experience here. Um, a little background. Um, this is my second year here at Great River in this role. Prior to this, I served as IB coordinator and as sort of a general program coordinator at McDowell Montessori School in Milwaukee. I'm originally from the Twin Cities and got to come back home last year, and I'm really happy to be here, and I've just been floored what I've experienced here. My own two children attend here in the elementary program. Um, it's a really special place, and I'm really happy to be able to share it with you here tonight. So the purpose of tonight is to talk about the 9th through 12th grade program and what I decided to do instead of spending a bunch of time talking about like all the logistics of the programs and schedulings and really in the nitty-gritty I want to spend some time and just talk about why on earth your students should go to school here there are tons of schools in the Twin Cities if you are a current student here there are tons of great schools around us if you are coming from uh, other schools there are wonderful schools everywhere why on earth would you attend the GRS in the 9th or 12th grade or for the high school program? Well, there are three big reasons why. And I want to, I think these three reasons really hone in on like what is special about the Great River School. We are a small community focused school. It may seem like we're actually decent sized because there's something like 800 students here on a daily basis and 120 staff all in. So, I mean, by from a school standpoint, it isn't okay, it's a decent size. But if we talk about the 9th through 12th grade program, it's 250 or so, 300 students. Okay, when you compare that to other area high schools, that's obviously really, really small. So it's a small school, and that allows us to build some really great community with, these, with each other. We also focus a lot of the work that we're doing on this idea of shared history. So we want the students to come away with like a coherent experience in their high school because that's what they're gonna remember. And then of course, this is what parents often wanna hear, is that we have a rigorous internationally minded curriculum that will challenge students and prepare them for life outside of school. But we of course are much more than just the academics. So we're gonna start with a small community focused school. And I wanna open up and talk a little bit about, of course, the uh, scientist on which our school is based on, Maria Montessori. She wrote this. Through practical exercises, the children develop a true social feeling. For they are working in the environment of the community in which they live, without concerning themselves as to whether it's for their own or for the common good. That's what we're striving towards here. We want to stay in a smaller community. We want to build community with each other that we're invested in uh, and that we're working towards doing good work with. So, when Maria Montessori set out on this educational journey of hers, she really started by observing what was going on and trying to understand what was going on, not like for educational purposes, but for human development. And what she presented was that human development or humans developed on four planes, infancy, childhood, adolescence, and then into maturity. We, of course, tonight here are interested in the adolescent plane of development. She writes down here social independence. What we mean by social independence and what we mean by social is we don't like mean like, oh, we've got friends and we're always talking to each other and we're always gabbing away and we're texting late into the night. What we really mean is the idea that we are, that our students are learning how to exist in a society and of course in the adult society. So everything that we are doing here is really about preparing students to be prepared adults, how to exist in the society and have all the skills to be successful when they move out into the adult society. They're in a sensitive period for belonging for focus, for independence, for concern for society. So they got that social justice-like streak in them at this age, right? Which we want to foster and we want to try to like, keep them going with. So everything we do is based on this idea, right? It's, it's about trying to exist within the community that we live in. So we're trying to give them the skills to be successful in that. One of the really huge benefits of bringing a small school is that our guides get to teach across multiple levels and multiple age groups. So oftentimes, you know, at Roseville High School, at Central High School, you, like you've got somebody, you are the ninth grade science teacher, or you are the 12th grade math teacher. Here, our guides seek students for multiple years. We structure our program um, in sort of loosely into two levels, the lower adolescent level, which encompasses the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, 
The seventh, eighth, and ninth grade mostly shares a lot of the same teachers. So if you are potentially a student who's an incoming ninth grader, your teacher at your guide at ninth grade, you probably saw at seventh and eighth grade if you were a seventh and eighth grade here. So those ninth grade guides you might experience know the students already and they know what's going on. At 10th through 12th grade, we have our upper adolescent program that share the bulk of the staff. So those students going into 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, there's all guides that they're familiar with, that they probably they may have had as an instructor already. Because what that allows us to do is like have continuity of experience. So students get to know a guide over the course of two years. They learn those expectations really early on, and they can really focus on learning and engaging and exploring the topic uh, because they have built that relationship. Right, so it's one of the benefits of being a small school. We also are able to bring in a lot of community aspects through our schedule. So I figure I talk just briefly about the schedule that the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders experience. So we run an A day, B day rotation, which is pretty common. We've got a block schedule, so our class periods are 85 minutes. You see each class uh, twice a week, either on a Monday, Thursday, or a Tuesday, Friday. Um, we have, on a typical day, the students see four classes. They also have advisory and lunch in the middle of the day. We'll talk more about advisory in a moment. Um, one of the, again, one of the really great benefits of being a small school with actually a comparatively large staff is that our class sizes stay, stay small. Our average class size is about 20. Of course, that means they range from on the low end of seven and on the high end, potentially 30, depending on the class and the space. Um, but we keep the average class size low here. We also have an independent work block every day. So a student has four classes in the day, but really only three of them are academic courses generally. Um, one of them is what we call indie work or independent work time. Um, so the students have time during the day to actually work and get the support of their staff as well. On Wednesdays is where we get to have a lot of fun. And again, this is a byproduct of being a small school and having a lot of flexibility with what we do. Is that Wednesday, sort of take the time off for like the really intense academics and we focus on teaching the students how to like give them the skills to be independent. So they start off every Wednesday with a three hour chunk of independent work time. So that means they roll in with their advisor and they sit down, they plan out what they're gonna do and they get to work. Now obviously ninth graders coming in have to learn how to do this, although elementary students do it pretty well. Um, adolescents get a little squirrely and so they have to sort of relearn the skill but they get a chance to sit down and get a three hour chunk of work time in. And so the guides work with them to teach them how to plan out the work that they're doing, how to try to get them into flow. It's also a really wonderful time for students to get help. And so if they roll in and we, they know that every single guide is monitoring a big, huge work block, that means they know, hey, if my advisor is actually this guide, but I need help from this guide over there, well, they've got time Wednesday morning for sure to go walk over and go check in with that guide and get the support that they need. Because everyone, and actually everyone in the building, 7 through 12, has got independent work time at that time. So they've got the ability to get lots of support. Um, then every Wednesday, we've got community meetings and advisory, which again, I'll talk to you about in just a moment. And then we finish off the day in something called creativity, activity, and service, which is part of our shared history uh, section, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So we get, in our schedule, we get a chance to do a lot of really interesting and creative things with students. And we've got the flexibility to support them and shift around what we're doing. Um, to give them the time and the support that they need. Mention advisory a couple of times. So every student, every adolescent student in the building has an advisor. That is a teacher that, that they meet with every day for at least a half an hour to build relationships with them and also to build relationships with the other students. Again, we are a community-focused school. We're focused on relationships. We want to make sure that students have really great relationships with the guides because if they have really great relationships with the guides, that means they're more likely to get help, um, ask for support, take risks, those sorts of things, and academic risks. Um, so they meet daily with advisors. We do, in advisory, among other things, we do community building circles at least once a week. So the students all circle up uh, and have a meeting. The students run this meeting. They've got a students are facilitators. Students keep track of planners. Um, so they get together and sort of hold a class meeting. We also do um, a series of social emotional learning lessons. So some really great SEL work was coming out of the elementary and we we're able to expand it out to the adolescents. So adolescents now get all these extra social emotional learning lessons as well. And then there's also, of course, some inter-advisory fun, right? There's competitions between the different advisories. Uh, there are, um, in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, uh, the different advisories take on um, setting up different fun events for students to do in the community meeting, which I'll talk about next. We also do weekly community meetings. 
These community meetings can take a lot of forms. In the ninth grade, it's always a ninth grade community meeting. So every week, all of the ninth graders, all 68 of them get into, it's actually two rooms together, um, and have a big meeting and talk about what's going on in the ninth grade. What are we struggling with? What support that we need? What conflicts are we having in the ninth grade that we need to address? Um, in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, it goes back and forth. Um, every other week, they get together by grade. So all the 10th graders get together, all the 11th graders get together, all the 12th graders get together. And again, talk about what's going on on that level, what students are struggling with, what support that they need, um, what conflicts are arising that we need to solve, what problems in the community are there. And then also twice a month, the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, all 210 of them, gather in the performance space and have a big community meeting with all of them. And what's really magical is that these community meetings are student-led. The students are the ones getting together to plan for these meetings. They lead the meetings, uh, they bring in guest speakers, they set up Q&A uh, &A sessions. Um, so it's really the students taking ownership of these times so that they can guide their own communities. The next thing we do really well at Great River is shared history. I picked out a Leonard Nimoy quote. It says, the miracle is this, the more we share, the more we have. We want to make sure that the students are sharing lots of experiences here. There's that like old adage that a student is not going to remember the history homework that they did that one Thursday night, but they are going to remember the people and the experiences they have at high school. So we take that to heart here. First and foremost, if you are already a family at Great River, you know about this. If you are not a Great River family, you know that you know about the fall key experiences. So at the beginning of every school year, we send all the students off on at least a week-long trip. We do this within the first few weeks of school, which sounds chaotic if you've never seen it before, and I assure you that it absolutely is a little chaotic, but it's a really wonderful time for them to build community and get to know each other, but then also get to know the guides that are on these trips as well. So the ninth graders historically always go to a farm. Lately, it's been the Philadelphia Community Farm, uh, which is in Wisconsin, just across the river from Stillwater, and up about 15 minutes. Um, we've had a relationship with this farm for a lot of years. Uh, so that's where the ninth graders go at the beginning of the year. The 10th graders, have, over this last year, went to Lake Itasca State Park to the headwaters of the Mississippi uh, and studied hydrology and uh, why this, why, is, is Lake Itasca actually the headwaters of the Mississippi? which of course was a, like a really great opportunity to talk about their own headwaters and their own journey. So we could use the river as, an, as like a, a metaphor for their own lives. And so we did reflection and thought about um, where they're going from there. The juniors always go on a big, huge college tour through Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, so they visit four or five colleges over three or four days. And then the 12th graders have always gone on a canoe trip. And so again, these are, sh these are shared stories that these students have. This canoe trip has been going on for years. The fall key experiences have happened since the school started. So this is something that students are doing every single year. It's something that's really uniquely great for me. So it is a bit chaotic. It is at the beginning of the year. It does take up time. It does take up effort. It's exhausting. So the question is, well, then why do we do it? There are six reasons why we do these trips. The first one, of course, is to build community and set community norms. We want to get to know each other. We want to know what to expect, right? The, the ninth grade trip, for instance, yes, is going to include a lot of students who have been here together, but maybe it includes some new students, right? Maybe it's getting students out of their comfort zone to meet other people. So we're setting norms with each other. We also use it uh, as, a, as an idea of pedagogy of place, which means we're using the place, the location, to enhance with which we're studying. The ninth graders talk a lot about ecology and interdependence, which is really awesome to talk about it when you're on a farm. So they get to use the land itself as part of the curriculum. There is social emotional learning going on there. The 11th graders, for instance, go to the ropes course uh, at UW Stout. And of course, they always use the ropes course and the challenges that you're doing and talking about um, parallels to the challenges they're going to have as adults. We use it to build independence. The students take care of most of the stuff on their own. They're the ones that unload the vans and the buses. They're the ones that set up the tents. They're the ones that do all the cooking and all the cleaning. It's actually pretty cush as a guide. You get to sit there, the students cook for you, they clean up for you, it's wonderful. <laughs> of course, we also do this because we value the outdoor experience. We know the effect that nature has on a human is positive. We know adolescents need to be out moving their body. 
we value that. Therefore, all of these trips, their bias is towards doing things outdoors. We camp everywhere. The cooking is done generally outside. We're outside all day. Right? That's why we do it. So that all of this here becomes part of the GRS shared experience. It doesn't matter if you graduated 10 years ago, five years ago, you're a senior this year, you're an eighth grader right now, that canoe trip is gonna happen. You can go back and talk to GRS, uh, GRS alumni, they, yep, the canoe trip, yep, we did this, yep, we fell in here, yep, we camped here, the weather was great, the wind was terrible, whatever it was, right? They have that shared experience. We also, in the ninth through 12th grade, have something called spring intensives. So what we do every year is we finish things off a little bit early. So school generally ends the first week of uh, June. We finish up most of our academics the last week of April. And what that allows us to do is the students get to do all these exploratory courses. So students sign up for these week-long experiences so that they're out of the classroom doing things that they wouldn't necessarily um, always do. For some examples for last year, the students could choose from um, working with a housing agency in the state, in, in Minneapolis. Uh, there was a group that planned their own trip. Uh, it was a ninth grader that planned their own trip to go up fly fishing, and then they went on the trip. Uh, there was a group of students and a few guides that visited a few state parks from the area. Uh, there was a guide that did a film spring intensive where the students actually filmed their own short film and then presented it in the span of a week. Uh, there was a spring intensive that put on a one-act play in the span. Like they started it on a Monday and they presented it on a Friday. Uh, we had students making doing bookmaking. So there's these wonderful opportunities. At ninth grade, they get to start and like just choose different ones. By the time they're seniors, the big senior capstone project at Great River is that they actually design and go on their own spring intensive. So the seniors don't generally participate in these ones with the 9th, 10th, 11th graders. They plan their own and go off. So for instance, we had one student last year who, their, we actually had two students that built pizza ovens at their houses as part of their spring intensive. They had to submit plans and they had to show pictures at the end of it. Um, we had students that uh, went on their own college tours and went on their own trips. And so the students are doing it themselves. So again, something the school has been doing for a lot of years, part of the shared experience of Great River. And I also felt this was a wonderful time to talk about CAS, which is called Creativity Activity Service. This is something that we do every Wednesday, which is kind of like spring intensives, but it's on month rotations. So students, every Wednesday, for the last two or three hours of the day, get to choose something. I call it non-academic because it's not an academic course that they're doing. They're not getting graded. They just choose cool stuff to do. Uh, and it's all 7th through 12th grade. You don't always have a 7th graders and 11th graders in the same room for these casts, but everyone's doing casts on the after, in the afternoon on Wednesdays uh, to give you a few examples of the types of activities the students are doing. In the bottom left there, they are baking. So we did a baking cast where for four days we were in the kitchen. Uh, for four weeks we were in the kitchen baking and cooking. Uh, we had a teacher uh, teaching students how to do green wood weaving. So some of their work is up there on the right hand corner. So we're doing weaving, and there was another group down here. This is a new one this year in the bottom right. We worked with an organization called Move MN that specializes in teaching students how to use Metro Transit. Many of our students use Metro Transit pretty often, uh, but this group takes another layer on where they like learn how to do transfers. They learn how to go to um, some of like the bus hubs where there's multiple different buses coming. So they learn how to navigate that. They learn how to navigate between buses and the green line, for instance, or the blue line. So they're all over the place, all over the city. So they're learning how to do these things again. In the name of independence, we want the students to be able to um, do this as adults too. Finally, Great River has a wonderful academic program. I'm gonna borrow a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It says, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. And that's also our goal here. That's really what the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade program, and really a 7, 8 as well, is trying to achieve. The foundation of that, I kind of think of it as four things. We have the arts, we have the humanities, we've got STEM, and we have our international baccalaureate program. Just like any other high school in the state of Minnesota, we have a certain number of graduation requirements. So I figured I'd throw this slide in to assure everyone that students are getting all the requisite English, social studies, math, science, fine arts, world language electives, all of these things. We talk extensively with the students um, about what this means and so that they really understand what they're supposed to be doing. All of our conversations we have with the kids are about maximizing their potential here. 
right? We don't really talk about like, oh, the minimum graduation requirement. Almost all students are taking, you know, they have required to take four years of English and social studies, but almost everybody's taking four years of math, four years of science. Most are taking four years of arts. A good chunk of the students are taking four years of a foreign language and then lots of electives. So there are a lot, like the students are engaged. They are taking a lot of classes. They are very academically minded when they need to be. In the ninth grade, we have a pretty like standard ninth grade curriculum where the, the classes that all the ninth graders take. All the ninth graders take what's called integrated math two. Instead of having a straight up geometry algebra class, uh, we integrate the classes, which actually works better pedagogically. So what the ninth graders experience is mostly geometry with some algebra thrown in. For science right now, the ninth graders all take biology. Although for next year's ninth graders, that flips over to chemistry. Uh, the state of Minnesota changed their science graduation requirements, so we had to shift our science classes around. Um, so any, ninth, any prospective ninth graders, incoming ninth graders, will be chemistry next year. For English, it's a standard English literature class. Uh, for social studies, they take a semester of civics and then a semester of economics. Uh, and then they also, everyone takes Spanish. And then there are a whole bunch of electives that they can choose. We've got multiple visual arts classes. Uh, we have multiple theater classes. We have multiple music classes. We actually have math elective classes. Uh, we've got other science classes that are also electives that they can take. Also, the ninth graders have the option of taking some of the electives with the seventh and eighth graders which maybe sounds not that appealing for some ninth graders, but when you consider the seventh and eighth graders have robotics as an elective, a bike shop as an elective, um, there's some pretty cool stuff that the ninth graders also get access to if they wish. Once we're up in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, that's when sort of the variety of different things, the, stu the paths the students can take, starts to go up quite a bit. Uh, in English, the 10th graders uh, follow, or the, for English, the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders follow a pretty standard progression from literature and culture to IB, International Baccalaureate uh, Literature. Uh, in 10th grade, everyone takes Spanish 2, and then from there can split into Spanish ab initio, or Spanish SL. Uh, so there are two separate Spanish classes. Uh, Spanish SL is, is, frankly, more difficult and more rigorous uh, and pushes Spanish to a higher level than ab initio. Um, after history of the Americas, so the history of Americas, which is which is based on the IB history curriculum, um, so we've been able to take the IB the IB history curriculum and turn it into a tenth grade course. Uh, and then in eleventh and twelfth graders, they have a choice between IB global politics and a general world history survey course. For science, at tenth grade, there are multiple different options uh, based on what the students uh, are interested in, as well as they'll take health for a semester in tenth grade. Uh, at 11th and 12th graders uh, can then take either IB environmental sciences or IB biology. Math, we move on to integrated three, which finishes out the, the continuum of the 7th and 8th graders actually take integrated math one, the 9th graders take integrated math two, 10th graders take integrated math three, and then it breaks into math analysis and math applications. And then there are tons of electives, IB visual arts, drawing and painting and ceramics and sculpture and musicianship and choir and theater tech. Uh, there's just a plethora of things and pathways the students can take. So I've mentioned International Baccalaureate a few times, so I'll elaborate. If you don't know, IB stands for the International Baccalaureate, and we specifically have the diploma program. The diploma program for IB is just their 11th and 12th grade program. It is a college preparatory uh, curriculum. It's not inherently a college preparatory curriculum. It wasn't designed initially to be a college preparatory program, but it very much does prepare students really well for college. It's another program where at senior years, students can take a bunch of examinations so that they can get college credit as well. Uh, the IB also has what's called the IB diploma. So when a student graduates from GRS, they get a diploma from GRS. But if they go through um, a certain testing program with the International Baccalaureate, they actually get an IB diploma, uh, which, really, which actually results in generally a little bit of extra college credit too. Um, so it's sort of a, another layer on top of graduating as well. And we've been really successful with this. Historically, if you look at GRS over the last 15 years with this IB program, we've had more than 75% of students who attempt actually get the diploma, which means they've tested in every single subject, they've taken an exam in every single subject, plus they've written a 4,000 word essay, plus they've submitted a huge portfolio of all of their classwork. So they do a lot. Our students are generally really successful in the IB program, and that's a testament to the, the guides that we have. They push the kids really hard. 
and the students have like rise to the occasion. IB is wonderful. It's a, it's great for students going into college, but the truth is, IB prepares students just really well to be an adult. There's a really wide variety of things that they cover in IB. It's a wonderful opportunity to see a lot of consistency across the curriculum. They're seeing themes move through all the different courses. Uh, so it really like teaches them to be critical thinkers. It teaches them to um, integrate like across the curriculum. So like they're applying concepts that they're learning in English class to their science class. It sets them up really well to think like that as an adult. So whether they're going off into college, whether they're going off into internship or just working, um, it prepares them very well for that. And what's really nice is that IB looks a little bit different and has, has a few other benefits at Career River than you might get from another school. For instance, Central High School in St. Paul has a big IB program, right? There's IB programs at Patrick Henry. There's IB programs everywhere in the city. But the one at Career River is better, and this is why. One, we're an IB for all school, which means all of our 11th and 12th graders take IB courses. There are a few courses at 11th and 12th graders that aren't uh, 11th and 12th grade that aren't IB, but every single one of our 11th and 12th graders is taking almost every single one of their classes is an IB course, right? And what they found when they've done research on IB programs is that the real benefit for the students is the course itself, right? A lot of people think, oh, IB is great because the exams, and if you look at exam scores, it translates directly into college success. Exam scores are great, college credit is great. But what matters the most is being exposed to this curriculum. And all of our students are. You go to Central High School, it's a school within a school. There's a small subset of IB students within this larger, huge program. And that's actually what's at most, if not all, other IB high schools in the state. So we have got everybody in those IB courses because we know it doesn't matter where you're coming from and who you are, IB has a huge benefit for you. We also, because I talked about CAS, had this wonderful CAS internship program. So on Wednesday afternoons, everyone gets together, does all these CAS things, does all these really wonderful activities. The 11th and 12th graders are almost all off campus. And so they take all these experiences and all these skills and all these interests that they've gained, and they all go do internships. So starting in 11th grade, they all plan out and then they go off to internships. We have students uh, at the Humane Society on Wednesday afternoons. We have students uh, that are working in like the Best Buy Tech Center are not working, they're in this internship with Best Buy. Um, we have students all over the place doing wonderful things, working at the University of Minnesota in labs. It's a wonderful experience. Um, we also have, what's really nice, is our IB coordinator, who's Lindsay Weaver, has the release time and spends a lot of her time directly supporting the IB students. There's special IB intervention groups, there's special IB advisory time, there's like another layer of adult in there to support the students pursuing these diplomas. And also what has been wonderful for me to see, because I have also, I came from another small IB program. We have way more offerings than the IB program I came from. We are a small school with 70, with 140 kids in the IB program. Generally that means, sorry, generally that means there's one science class they take or one math class that they can take or one visual arts or one arts class that they can take. We have three different options in arts. We have two in math, two in Spanish, two in science, which I mean, compared to a, maybe a huge school isn't a lot, but for a small school, there's a lot of variety that the students have the ability to be a part of, right? So we're really maximizing the potential of our guides and the potential of our schedule to get the students, despite being in a small school, get them a whole lot of opportunities. Of course, that academics and the experience doesn't just stop us at the classroom. We have a wonderful array of activities. We have a huge Ultimate Frisbee is huge here. Theater is huge here. Uh, we co-op with uh, Twin Cities Academy so we can have larger sports teams as well. We have some in-house sports teams that are just GRS, but a lot of them we work with another school to field a full team. Our student leadership program is really, really active. We've got like four or five different robotics teams in the adolescent program. Uh, we have the Gender Sexuality Alliance that is super active here. Uh, we've got chess clubs, we have a cloud club, we have art club, we have all these different uh, clubs uh, and opportunities for students, and almost all of them are student-led, right? Art club was a bunch of students getting together saying, hey, art teacher, we would like an art club. And they plan it out, and they schedule it, and they're there here. The chess club is student-run. The theater um, has so many experienced students that the theater practices run themselves practically, right? So we have a lot of opportunities for these things despite being a small school. 
I want to conclude by talking about, should you choose to enroll here, what do your students need to be successful? This is the important thing. We are a small school, um, so we can keep track of students, but we can't do it alone. So we're going to talk about the things that we can do for our students to be successful. We need to recognize that students need lots of support. They generally don't want anything to do, they often don't want anything to do with their family, and they're usually fine. But the students need lots of support, so we recognize that. We give them lots of support with their advisors and their core guides and all the adults in the building, but we do need to partner with parents to make sure they get that support. Students also need to be really, like, need to recognize that they need to keep a planner. With seven, eight different classes, with three hour chunks of work time, they need to learn how to plan. Again, we put in lots of systems here uh, to help teach them that, but that's one of the keys to success here. They also, as with the world these days, they'll need to be pretty proficient in technology. We use Schoology, we have all the Google apps. Um, we use JSTOR for research, so the students are going to use technology. We have a one-to-one -one Chromebook program, so they have access to what they need. Uh, but that's a component of our program as well. We also work hard with them, and hopefully they continue to work hard at home on work habits and routines. They're going to have follow-up work. They're going to have tons of homework. Obviously, the amount of homework progresses as they get older, but they need to start working on those routines now. Um, again, it's stuff that we work on at school as well, but we can't do it alone. We also don't want the students to forget the practical life. If you've been in Montessori for very long, you know about the practical life. I like to think about the practical life with my three or four year old. They were folding towels and doing dishes. One of the first things my, my youngest son, I remember watching him do when he like wandered in at age two to my wife's classroom, who's a primary teacher. And he just like realized he could walk over to the sink and then grab his glass of water and fill it up and then drink it and then wash it with the rag that's right there and then dry it off and put it in the drying rag. And then he walked away and then he came back. He did like the thing five times at an open house night at a school. And adolescents need those sorts of things too. They need to be able to work with their hands. They need to like learn how to do their own laundry again. They need to work on cooking dinner. They need to help out with chores. They need to help repair tents here at school uh, and help cook dinner for, um, for conferences. So they need those experiences too. So I encourage families to really push them hard because they will be better for it. And then of course, we must give them grace. They are still teenagers. They may look like adults, but they are like sometimes three-year-olds at heart. And so they do need a lot of love and understanding and communication. We do it a lot at school. We share a lot of love with them. We are very accommodating. We focus really much, we focus a lot on finding the root of any problem that they have. Um, but give them some understanding and give them grace. And then of course, as parents, there are school newsletters. I send out a program update uh, a few times a month. We have informational nights here. We've got open house. We've got like work share nights for students. We've got tons of theater events and athletic events. Um, so we need everyone all hands on deck because the adolescents need our support. So we're going to shift gears to a little Q&A session. The question was if we have writing classes as extracurriculars. Right now, I don't think we have any writing focused extracurriculars, although I believe there is a book club that is starting up second semester. So it's not quite writing, but in the same area. So the question was talking about transition from a public school into Great River. I just want to confirm we are a public school. We are publicly funded. Um, but if we think about a traditional school into a Montessori school, I've seen it happen a lot. It's generally really successful. The big difference is the focus on independence. And so like the independent work time, that, that three hour chunk of time on Wednesday morning takes some time getting used to. And it's not something that students are usually used to doing. Um, there's also a lot of onus put on the students and a lot of like executive function that we work towards that might be different. Um, and then also I think the amount of time we spend in advisory and doing things like community meeting can be really new to students. So, so sometimes like I've seen incoming ninth graders like not really knowing what to do. Like we're sitting in a circle again and talking about what's going on. Like it's something that's out of the ordinary that they just have to get used to. So the question was, is the three hour block of work time on Wednesday an opportunity for them to work on homework? Yeah. There's not like a separate assignment that's given out for Wednesday. It is a time for them to work. Uh, so whether it, they, they generally are the ones that figure out what it is that they're going to work on and they plan out their own weeks and plan out their times, but it's not like an extra project. It is specific time for them to work on math or history or whatever. Because all I say is that there is homework in ninth grade and there gets to be way more of it at senior year. So I would expect them to have something to do most nights at ninth grade. 
I would expect juniors and seniors to have 32 minutes to an hour of homework easily each night and probably be working on the weekends too. So at ninth grade is essentially the same math class in every section. So all the ninth graders take integrated math too. At 10th grade for integrated math three, there's actually two pathways um, in 10th grade integrated math three. Um, and that is based in that sort of like one prepares students specifically for the IB analysis course. And one of those pathways carries student or prepares students for the applications course in 11th and 12th grade. So it prepares them for two different IB math classes. Um, and so at like at the end of ninth grade, like the math guides start talking to the students about their hopes and dreams and like the, being able to try to figure out which math class they should go to. It doesn't really matter which math class they take in 10th grade. They could take either math class in 11th and 12th grade should they change their mind. But the two math classes at 10th grade are slightly different. The, the sections are slightly different based on which math class is preparing for. It's still, it's still integrated math three because it's still mostly the same curriculum. There's just different focuses and there's a few units that they swap out each other. Um, in general, like how do you know about what's going on in sports and activities? Um, we have and generally, a, we have a website with information. We have um, a monthly school newsletter that comes out and there's usually links to um, things like the sports calendars and information about sports. Um, I also send out um, a bi-monthly adolescent program specific update that will often include information like that too. So with like ultimate frisbee, like winter practice is coming up, there is some information in that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, we use for generally for most of our courses, we use a seven point rubric. So most of the grade that students will see, even in the ninth through twelfth grade, um, is like a, as a number one through seven, and that's based on. Um, the International Baccalaureate program generally uses a one to seven scale for its grades. So what students are gonna see, like generally on their assignments themselves, when they get feedback back from guides, it's gonna be on a one to seven scale. When it pops into PowerSchool, which is our like official grading system and it's where transcripts get stored, those grades, those, that one to seven scale gets shifted to an A through F. So students will see on transcripts, they will see their A through F grade, and that translates into a regular GPA and everything, too. So when we send off transcripts to other schools, colleges, whatever, they'll be able to see a regular old transcript. Do we have summer programs? Um, most of the summer programs that Great River have are geared towards uh, first through eighth graders. We don't have a lot in the ninth through twelve. Uh, there are some athletic things that go on over the summer. I know Frisbee is a little bit active during the summer, but we don't have a ton of that. The after school programming is all the extracurricular stuff that we have. Um, so whether it's sports, whether it's theater, whether it's after school music stuff, um, those are the sorts of things that we have after school. So um, for technology, we have a one-to-one -one Chromebook program at ninth through twelfth grade. That means all ninth through twelfth graders uh, receive a Chromebook and charger from us that they use uh, for school purposes. They can take home um, if they have a device that they have, like at home they've got a Mac laptop or something they'd rather use. That's totally fine. Um, for the Chromebooks and like, general internet access at school, we've got like a standard firewall that blocks various sites. Um, we've got the ability to block different sites or individual sites. Uh, we also use a program in the background. I think it's called Securely. I could be wrong about the name of the program that essentially tracks every all the internet traffic in our building, and it basically flags things. And so it's got like different flags set up for depending on different sites. And so our deans of students, for instance, at the end of every day, go through and check this program and look at anything that's flagged, um, so that we can keep an eye on what students are doing. So if students were to Google something you know, inappropriate or some troubling things, we can follow up with the social work and we can follow up with families, we can follow up with the students. Um, in terms of other technology procedures, um, we don't have a complete ban on phones. Uh, what we do is we say that phones generally, when we're in class, should remain away. If you have guide permission to use them, then that's totally fine. Um, we sort of run the rule of the guide asks you once to put it away and if not, it gets confiscated. Uh, generally, students are fairly respectful. Um, of that uh, in things like recess or lunch, the students can have their phones out. We don't generally control that much. But in the classroom, it's phones are away unless you absolutely need it. Um, what we've seen is since we've actually moved to a one-to-one -one Chromebook, phone use and phone distraction has actually gone down quite a bit because the students have what they need in the Chromebook. Because what's happened is that before we did that, the students were like, we'll be on their phone and like trying to pull up some information for history. And then they get a text or a ding from TikTok or whatever. Now that they're on their Chromebooks, they don't have that. They're all just focused on getting their paper written. And so I would say that most of the time the students do like take them out. 
Um, they don't get used all the time. You see them used a lot less in like math, for instance, because most of, most of the stuff they're writing down. Um, in English, I see them more because they're writing papers and annotating things. Um, but you, we do see them quite a bit. Like the students just kind of like naturally like sit down, pull their Chromebook out. Um, and then guys do a lot of like, you don't need your Chromebook now, you can close your Chromebook and put it away. Uh, so the students do default to that. So we do have PSEO, we do have students in PSEO. Um, so we do what happens when the students get to 11th grade, there's a big like PSEO and college info night that parents attend where we talk about the PSEO process. And so for students, that, and for those of you that don't know about PSEO, it's the post-secondary educational opportunity. It allows students to take college classes while they're in high school. Um, but those students, when they say that they might be interested in it, they do sit down with our director of student services. They sit down with um, our college counselor to figure out like, okay, what are the actual goals? Um, and does PSEO have the right fit? Uh, and so that is an opportunity. We do engage with it. We use it. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into it if a student is choosing to do that. The question was, do we take, is it possible to take other languages for credit? Um, from Like directly from our school? Not really. What we have had students do is they take, um, we have, some students will take uh, ASL online. So we've had some students that will do that. Um, we've had some students that will do uh, language courses through like Concordia language villages. Um, and then we can, we've given credit for things like that. But um, generally the students take Spanish. Yeah, so I can't speak to that particular situation, but I know that we've had students like pop up into the higher level Spanish classes earlier. Stacy, do you have more to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So if students are fluent in Spanish already, it'll depend on if they're going to do the IB diploma program or not. And so it, we've had one student who was fluent because he spoke it at home, but he was doing the diploma. He wanted. He ended up going to MIT. So he really wanted to have that diploma in his back pocket. So he just waited until 11th grade and then joined the IB science, Spanish classes and he can participate that in Spanish. He's helping lead the class in a lot of ways, but he can learn more grammar too. Like if you're speaking at home, you maybe haven't done as much grammar or composition work. Um, and so that's what a lot of students do. Uh, and we have a current eighth grader who was coming from a Spanish emerging class, like school, and or she, I guess she's probably 10th grade now, but she's been here a few while, but she's been bumping up into the IB Spanish classes ahead of time. So she's not doing beginning Spanish or intermediate Spanish in ninth and 10th grade. Although on that note, I want to be clear, the because this always happens a few times every year, about families who talk about like, hey, can my ninth grader pop up and take, a, like test out and take 11th grade classes? Or can my eighth grader pop up and take high school classes? As a general rule, that doesn't happen very often here. There are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but as a small school, that is something that we try to shy away from because we only have so many classes on offer. Um, so we don't do a whole lot of accelerating students. So we don't have like students coming in at ninth grade and taking the 11th and 12th grade math. Um, it's just hard to do as a big school, as a small school. We have a sort of modern band and so more focused on um, like class rock music essentially. School, school of rock, school of rock. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate all of you. This is a wonderful place and I hope I get to see everybody in the adolescent hallways soon. <laughs>